Hello and welcome to Viral History. Today we're here in the incredible v &A Museum and I'm joined by Olivia Horsfall turner who's going to talk to us about some incredible designs. So, Olivia, what are we looking at? We're looking at some designs for woven silks by James Lemon. Um, James Lemon was a Huguenot, second generation Huguenot, and was renowned during the early 18th century for being um, a designer of silks and also a master weaver himself. Can you tell us a little about um, the Huguenots? Who, who were they? The Huguenots were a, a, a group of um, French Protestants. They were, they were French Protestants who followed the teachings of Calvin um, and following persecution in the 16th century. They largely fled from France during the 17th century um, and settled um, throughout Europe. And James Lemon's father, Peter Lemon, um, came to England, came to Canterbury and settled there. And that's where um, he formed his own trade and then later moved up to London, to the east of London, to Spitalfields, where there was a, a strong Huguenot community and where James Lemon then became apprenticed to him in 1702. Okay, and so why do, we, why do we still know about James Lemon today? Well, one of the biggest uh, sources that we have about James Lemon um, is this set of designs, um, which are known as the Lemon Album. Um, we're looking at them in a disbound state, so um, there was a large book of designs, and you can see here the, one of the support pages from that book. Mm. Um, we're currently doing some conservation on it, so that's why we have the opportunity to look at them um, in there. Um, disbound state um, and we know a lot about him partly because he made a lot of annotations on his designs as well often mm -hmm. designers are anonymous yeah. um, and don't leave that many traces but here we have the most fantastic sort of introduction <laughs> to him and he really springs off the page um, in his signature um, James Lemon and then this wonderful flourish that he does. Yeah, underneath. he's got a really elaborate signature, hasn't he? He really wanted you to know he'd been here, I think. And also that he was very skilled and mm. that he had um, tremendous dexterity and that he was um, deft in, in penmanship. Um, and here you can see he signs them for my father, Peter Lemon, um, James Lemon. So there's a sense of his pride in his family tradition as mm, well. Mm. So I find it very poignant actually looking at, at these, um, the family connection there that he's so aware of it. There's another one over there where he says, um, for my father, by me, James Lemon. There's a yes, huge there's yeah. a pride in both, both father and son there. Very much so. And uh, am I right in thinking that he was quite unusual because he was not only a, a designer, um, but he was a weaver as well? For England, that was really unusual. Mm. Um, it was more common in France where the silk industry was very, very strong and flourished. But um, he, was, he was remarkable in England for having both those skills. But having both those skills meant that he produced really top quality silk. Um, so all of these designs um, potentially could have been woven up into really sumptuous fabrics mm. um, which were highly desired by the upper echelons of society. Mm. And can you talk us through some of these designs we're looking at here? Yes, I mean the, um, the one that we have here which shows um, a variety of different uh, fruits and, and flowers and foliage mm. um, which is still undergoing conservation, so I'm not going to open it quite fully <laughs> there. Um, but you can see um, these really bright colours, um, carnations, um, roses. Um, some of them have um, vegetables on. Okay. Um, you can see on this one here, this is sort of like a giant pea pod. Um, <laughs> And some of them have tomatoes, some of them have um, the roots still um, showing or a mound of earth. Um, and you'll notice the scale is really remarkable, the way in which um, he sort of plays with the size of different elements. Mm. And the style of designs that we see here are known as the bizarre style. Okay. Um, and I mean, that's just because they are bizarre. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they, were, they were known for being um, whimsical and full of fancy um, and having surprising juxtapositions. Mm. So for instance, on this design here, and there are enormous sort of breadfruit-like um, plants. Mm -hmm. um, there are um, tendrils, architectural motifs, uh, buildings. And then these are extraordinary moments where it almost looks as though um, they've been generated, uh, inspired by looking through a microscope. Yes, um, yeah. 
And we know that James Lemon was one of the um, early members of um, a botanical society. Right. So he had a huge interest in, in plants. Mm. Um, he was a very, very cultivated man. In mm. fact, I mean, the Huguenots generally were highly educated, um, very cultured group of people. And in his will, he talks about um, some of the things that he had, his collection of books, his collection of musical instruments, um, he had a collection of medals, and <laughs> my favourite, he had a collection of reptiles in oh, spirits. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I'd like to imagine that, for instance, with this design here, some of these curves, you can almost imagine if you have a snake um, yes. in a sample bottle, mm. that those um, flowing lines somehow are inspired by that understanding of, of the natural world. Yes. This is also remarkable because it shows um, what appears to be a series of elephants. It's really beautiful, isn't it? Um, pink elephants pink as well, elephants. my favourite kind of elephants. <laughs> um, so it has a, almost a kind of psychedelic um, Yeah, it does. It. And these mountain ranges almost that, that rise up. And here, I mean, to our eye, it looks um, as though, again, you're looking through a microscope mm -hmm. at, at something organic. Um, but elephants had been, um, were known through print sources. Mm. Uh, and in fact, there was a, an elephant that was brought to London in 1675. Oh, right, okay. um, so at that point, people were, were producing um, drawings um, and, and prints of them. So he would have been ha able to get access to imagery mm. uh, to inspire this. Because it, it feels quite oriental, doesn't it, in style? Yes, absolutely. And, and this one as well, you can see elements um, of the architecture, which mm. evidently it's not, it's not native um, British or, or continental European architecture. Um, these wonderful screens, which are um, really sort of chinoiserie um, in inspiration. And in fact, um, there's a, a print source here, which I think is probably mm. um, one of the major sources for elements in, in a number of his designs, particularly this one. Um, this is a, a facsimile of a book that was printed in 1688. Right, okay. So he might well have had this wow. on the shelves mm -hmm. in his library. And just thought that would look nice in silk. <laughs> exactly, and be able to pull out <laughs> these, these elements. So it's quite remarkable that we can actually trace from the sources that he might have been inspired mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. through to the actual designs that, that he produced. Um, I mean, they're so highly finished that it's almost hard to, to understand how he, he made them. Um, but sometimes you can see either underdrawing okay. or you can see where he's made changes. Um, for instance, the little uh, trees that are added in there. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, they're quite faint, aren't they, compared to the rest? They're very yeah. faint mm. and they're in pencil. Um, mm, mm. And so you can sometimes see as well adjustments. Um, the examples here don't show it, but if he wanted to change something, he might take a scalpel mm -hmm. and cut out the design, remove that section and then replace it <laughs> right, with wow. something else. Um, <laughs> They're beautiful. I mean, the, the colours are so vibrant as well. Do we know much about the paints that were used? Um, the, the dyes and the pigments mm. that, he, that he used to, to create these colours are, are um, natural dyes and pigments. Okay. Um, so they're very, very pure, which mm. is partly why they have such strong colours. Mm. Um, another reason is that they've never been exposed to light. These have never been displayed. Um, for most of their life, they were inside the album and therefore wow. protected. Yes. So it, it's very special to be able to <laughs> to see them now. And it it's does give incredible. you a sense of kind of time travel. This is very much what they must have been like when on the day that he finished them. Very much so. And in fact, we can even look and see exactly what day he finished them on here. This one was finished on June the 24th um, in 1708. Wow, um, really So incredible. he was very specific. And then he also gave details of the kind of fabric that he was producing. And also here, there are details of the um, the Mercer that he was making it for. Mm. So around all of these designs, there's a whole web of connections and conversations and, and the production of Spitalfield silk, which was a huge industry. Mm. Um, mm. And really there's a, a web of connections that stretches um, from Lemon as the designer, yes. through to the Mercer who would be commissioning things, through to the consumer who would be ordering the silk they wanted for mm. their latest ball gown, party frock. Wow. Um, so do we know any of the, would we know any of the people that potentially he's designed for? 
Um, what, has, what happened to the silks after they were actually produced is very hard to trace. Mm. Um, there are a couple of examples, only two, two known examples of silk actually woven by James Lemon. And okay. there must have been more. Yes. But obviously it's, um, it's very ephemeral as a stuff. Mm. Um, and incredibly, we do have in the collection the actual silk which relates to this design. Oh, wow. So we've been able to compare it. Mm. Um, it's even more psychedelic in its <laughs> colours than this. Um, partly because the, the ground that it's woven onto is actually bright pink. Wow, okay. So, you have so to even brighter that than it is now. With bright pink and then a really vivid uh, kind of emerald green. Wow. Um, so we don't, we don't know um, exactly who was buying his silks, um, but we know the type of person because it really had to be um, the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. The cost of these silks was, was huge because it was very time consuming to produce them. Mm -hmm. You can see how intricate they were and therefore um, it took a long time, perhaps um, a week to produce a couple of inches. Wow, oh my gosh. So to produce enough for a whole dress would have taken about three months. So you're really getting a bespoke, handmade, beautiful, exactly. expensive item. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And there's evidence that he um, limited the number, it was kind of like a limited edition, so he wouldn't right. make more than enough silk for four dresses, say. Okay. So that you wouldn't walk into a party and see oh, no. your rival. Terribly embarrassing, <laughs> in, another, <wouldn't> <laughs> in another dress. Yeah. That's incredible. So um, what's James Lemon's sort of legacy today? I mean, does he still, um, has he had a, a real influence on sort of silk making techniques that we know today in this country? The, the techniques of actually of, of weaving have changed. Um, so the advent of the Jacquard loom mm -hmm. um, changed the way in which silk was produced. So um, his way of making, of weaving silk is, is now um, only practiced um, uh, by very few people. Um, but in terms of his design and in terms of the inspiration that these designs now offer to creative mm. people, um, it still continues, absolutely. Yes. Um, I don't know if you've been to the Huguenot Museum in, I haven't, in Rochester. <laughs> um, and as you emerge from the train station at Rochester, you look and see a building that's actually covered in designs by wow. James Lemon. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, on a larger than life scale. Um, and there, of course, um, the, the story of um, a refugee community mm. coming to Britain and enriching the cultural life of the country yes. is something which is inspiring and tremendously important. Mm. And that's something that's quite interesting um, and quite topical at the moment, actually, refugees obviously exactly. coming into this country. So I'm, I'm wondering what sort of reception the Huguenots had when they came over. Were they welcomed? Yeah, the, there's, um, as any tight, you know, knit community, he also made a, a big impression. Um, the reception of the Huguenots was, was mixed. I mean, mm. there were some people who felt um, threatened by the advent of people who might uh, take away their jobs, for instance. Yes, this yeah. is all very familiar. It, it does sound very familiar, actually, <laughs> if you think of it, a few headlines, yeah. <laughs> um, James Lemon is an interesting case in point because he was um, admitted to the, weaving com the weaver's company mm. um, as, first of all, as a foreign master. But then having been admitted under that designation, he rose through the ranks right. to become second in command mm. of the whole company. Yeah. So it shows how much he was appreciated yes. and, he, and, and how much he was respected for the quality of his work. Mm. Um, and he also was involved in a lot of campaigns to protect English weaving right, um, okay. against imports mm. of, of other foreign uh, fabrics. So it's interesting that it's a good example of someone really embracing being part of, of British culture yes, um, yeah. and, and defending um, certainly the, the position of the, of the weavers company mm. against um, calico imports mm. in that case. We are planning as well um, a digital facsimile of them so people will be able to leap through um, each sheet and discover all the information that we've found out about the pigments, about the dyes, about the underdrawing, about the mercers for whom each design was made, mm. um, and about the sources. So it will be a really rich um, source for people to be able to explore. That's brilliant. So say I was a wealthy gentlewoman mm -hmm. um, back in James Lemon's day. If I wanted a silk dress design, for example, how would that work? Would I sort of show up at his workshop and 
would he sketch something for me? How would that process you'd kind of work? You'd probably deal with um, a, a middleman. You'd probably okay. deal with the mercer. Um, and so you might describe to the mercer what kind of a silk you were hoping for, what kind of a, a figure you wanted to cut at your <laughs> next important outing. And then the mercer would go to um, the pattern drawer, to James Lemon, mm -hmm. or to one of his associates, or to Anne-Maria Garthwaite, um, and would describe what was called for. Um, and that would be if you were commissioning something in particular. Mm. Um, the alternative would be that um, the mercer uh, might show you um, uh, either samples of silk that had already been woven that might interest you, um, or you might be able to see these designs which had already been produced but hadn't been purchased by anyone. Right. And then you could choose one that was effectively um, ready designed but not yet ready made. Okay, okay. And then of course you'd have to wait uh, before it was actually produced. Um, Mercers did also deal in uh, sort of off the, off the peg. <laughs> they might have already commissioned um, a length of silk, um, but probably because of the costs involved, would always have someone in mind for that. Mm. Um, so that relationship was very important. Mm. He seems to me to have a very distinct design. W was it sort of copied, for example, by other silk makers? Yeah. Like ripped off as such? I think. Um, <laughs> There was, there was a kind of premium placed on things being original mm. and things being um, distinctive. So that was what they were all trading on. Um, we can look um, over there at a couple of, of other designs. Um, mm -hmm. That one's by um, Christopher Badouin, okay. um, who was an associate of Lemon, and Lemon effectively employed him as part of his sort of atelier. And uh, like, um, uh, um, like Lemon, he was um, of uh, French origin. And again, you can see there that sort of expansive mm -hmm. um, style, perhaps more focused on, on sort of natural elements rather than on the architectural that Lemon was so interested yes, in. Yes, yeah. Um, and there was also another um, designer, um, Joseph Dandridge, uh, and all of them were involved in this early society collecting mm -hmm. botanic samples, um, collecting um, sort of natural items which mm -hmm. they could use for inspiration. Um, so it was, it was very much a style of the um, sort of period from 1710 to the 1720s. Mm. And then in the 1720s, there's more and more naturalism that comes in. Right. Um, but the bizarre style, I have to say, is my favourite. It's <laughs> these sort of unexpected um, juxtapositions. They, in some ways, they look quite modern. I, so yeah, I, I feel they that do, they've absolutely. really stood the test of time, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, we really think they need to be sort of rewoven and available yeah, as, definitely. as products definitely. to wear now. There's a lovely story about um, the process of designing. Mm. Um, there's a treatise which was written in 1756 that kind of looked back on the production of, um, of silk designs during the early 18th century. And it's very likely that it was written by Anna Maria Garthwaite, who herself was a, a pattern designer, and she was very unusual, obviously, for being a woman mm, in what was yes. otherwise a man's world. Mm -hmm. And she came to London when she was about 40 and then set up a business and was very successful. And through the um, 1730s uh, and 40s, she was producing about 80 designs a year, so she was quite mm. prolific. And then the, the treatise that she wrote about designing talks about how um, she'd heard a story about a mercer going to a pattern drawer um, to get a new design for a fabric. Mm. And the pattern drawer showed various samples um, and probably showed designs very much like this. Um, and the mercer didn't like any of them. <laughs> and the pattern drawer said, well, you know, what do you want then? How can I possibly <laughs> please you? And he looked around the room and saw that there was a servant girl who was grilling sprats. Uh, right. on, a, on an iron over the grate. And he said, put that in the design. And so apparently these um, fish on a grill pan were then incorporated into the design. Right. And she says that it made a great design because it was odd. <laughs> and therefore it sold really well. Yeah, because so it's unusual. Mm. A sense of, of the, the way in which fashion was sort of driving things. Yes, and that yeah. people were, um, I suppose people were having fun. This was something that was enjoyable and that had a sense of humour in it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one of the first things I thought when you started sort of carefully getting them out of their cases was I was so impressed by the colours. Yeah. And um, they're incredibly eye-catching. I mean, 
I think it would be a bold statement to wear something like that today, an entire dress made out of something absolutely. like that. So yes. they're absolutely beautiful. And you have to remember too that a lot of them were woven with um, gold and silver thread through wow. them as well. Of course they were. <laughs> so um, just to add that little extra something. A little so bit they, of bling. Exactly. <laughs> they would have um, they would have shimmered and sparkled as you entered a room. And if you wow. think of turning up at a, a ball. Uh, everything candle lit mm. and then into the room you step with this wonderful um, gold uh, woven silk and often they the designs actually play with that idea about light mm. so there are some that have candle motifs and so you can imagine walking in and it looks as though the candles on your dress yeah. are actually a light wow <laughs> Hopefully they weren't really a light. Really you know, light. <laughs> brush past a candle. <laughs> exactly. um, you were saying that so, uh, some of these um, have been through a sort of conservation process recently. How does that work? Yeah, it's a very, very <laughs> delicate um, process and we're very fortunate to have a fantastic um, senior paper conservator who has been doing this work. Um, you can see from this design here that's still inside, um, on, on, mounted on the album page, mm -hmm. that when something is inside the album, um, it's often been damaged. The, the folds and the pressure of the book itself has right. taken its toll on the designs. Um, and so, because they are um, so special, so they are unique, they're the earliest known silk designs to survive, woven silk designs to survive in the world. Wow. Um, we have a duty of care to them. Mm. Um, and so we decided that really the best course of action was to remove them where possible from the support papers. Um, and the support papers are not original to the design. Right, okay. So you can see from um, some of the old folds on these designs um, that they've been, if we turn this one over, um, you can see that they've been made of more than one sheet. And on some yes. of them, you can see that they've been folded up and probably put into a drawer or mm -hmm. they've been stored mm -hmm. completely differently. And then at some point during their life, they were put into the album mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where they remained. So our decision to remove them from the pages was kind of a one that we only undertook after quite a lot of <laughs> philosophical heart searching. Yeah. Um, and because they haven't always been in the album, we mm. feel it's legitimate, and also because it was damaging them, it was legitimate to remove them. So they've been taken off with um, the use of a steam pencil, okay, um, which which <laughs> helps to lift them. Um, some of the some of the colours um, are um, very sensitive, and the pigments are, are responsive to to heat and to moisture. Mm. So they've also some of them have been lifted off using a technique of um, gels, which right. provides just enough moisture to uh, release them, but not so much that it will damage the object. Wow, it's a very, very delicate process. I can imagine that yeah. it's quite stressful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I, I watch with awe as our <laughs> conservators work on it. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but what, what that has enabled us to do is also to find out a lot more about the objects themselves. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's exposed um, more inscriptions on the back, oh, which wow. have been hidden. Mm -hmm. um, in a couple of cases, we've found extra bits of paper that had been used as sort of padding um, and or sort of an extra sheet on the back, mm. which showed some underdrawing, some preliminary sketches oh, wow. that wow. James Lennon had done, really which was just thrilling. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's a small thing, but actually, because we know so little about um, how these really were created, mm. it's, it's really tantalizing to have even a small snippet of, of information. Yeah, definitely. Well, I feel incredibly privileged to have seen them. Um, they are absolutely stunning. Well, and it's making me think I should add more silk to my wardrobe. I think that's an excellent, <laughs> excellent idea. Everybody needs more silk, particularly with psychedelic elephants. On. Particularly those ones, I think yes. that's the one we need yeah. to get made up as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to that's us and for sharing us these amazing uh, designs. A great Thank pleasure. You. Thanks. Thanks.